And I am the ECTMH um, organizational chair, um, the head of the Migration Health Unit at New Santé and clinical researcher at Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And I have the pleasure to introduce the content co-chairs of this session. We have Dr. Katja Viss, an infectious disease specialist at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden, and board member of the Swiss, um, sorry, Swedish Society of Tropical Medicine and Infectious Disease, with her research focusing in the interaction between non-communicable diseases and malaria, including studies in both travelers and migrants. We also have Dr. Guido Caleri, an infectious and tropical disease specialist at the Amedio di Savoia Hospital in Turin, Italy. He is the president of the Italian Society of Tropical Medicine and Global Health, um, with his main interest in malaria and other vector-borne diseases and travel health. So, welcome. The purpose of this session is to give an overview of the emerging challenges that increasing migration poses to the healthcare systems in Europe. Uh, and yes. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I just want to highlight that this symposium was organized under the, the umbrella of the Federation of the European Society of Tropical Medicine and International Health. Uh, and specifically, it was organized, uh, it's a joint meeting organized by the Italian Society of Tropical Medicine and uh, um, Global Health, by the Swedish Society of uh, um, Tropical Medicine International Health, and by, uh, the, uh, Société de la, uh, the, the, by the French Society, which is actually the uh, Société Francophone de Médecine Tropicale et Salud Internationale, uh, with this former name of uh, Société de Pathologie Exotique, which was really a wonderful, wonderful name, but a bit, a bit old, of course. Um, with the support also of the uh, ESCMID study group for infectious and travelers and migrants. So, um, and I think this, this collaboration uh, under, in, in the um, Federation of the European Society gives reason to, to this symposium, to many collaborations within the society, and to this Congress itself. So, this is why we have to, to thank the, the European Federation. Okay, so, so, so with that, please. I would like to welcome uh, Anna Rikena on the stage. Have the Honored to present um, Anna, who is assistant professor at the Barcelona uh, International Global Health, where she leads the migrant health research area. She's also affiliated um, researcher at Karolinska Institute, and she has been one of the experts developing the ECDC guidelines for uh, screening in migrants in Europe. So please, Anna. Um, good morning to everybody, and really thank you for the opportunity of, of these societies and also for the study group uh, for inviting me to give this talk. My name is Anna. I'm also an infectious disease doctor, and since uh, quite a lot of years, um, I have been trying to work in trying to generate evidence around the screening of infections and other conditions in migrants. And any time that I talk about infections and migrants and a little bit of a screening, I would like to start with a provocative message. Um, the thing is that in, we are almost health professionals or, you know, professionals working with uh, or migrants or infections, so we know, we have a clear message, but what do you think that is the, um, the thinking or the thoughts about the civil society when thinking, when putting together infections and migrants? This is unfortunately some message that sometimes we are providing to the society. That is a picture about uh, two, two centuries ago. And that is how the society is sometimes perceiving the migrant population. As a, historically, mig migrants perceive that's a risk to native population because of the infections that they may introduce. And that is from um, 1883. 
Unfortunately, still, I'm pretty sure that we may have some other examples not so many years ago, whereas the reality is another one. That is the reality, which is actually the population mobility and not the migrant population. So a clear message, an important message to me that uh, we need also, always at health professionals to provide is that we should not blame migrant populations because of the risk of emerging. We have the clear example about COVID-19, how in few weeks, you know, the disease was spreading worldwide. Having said that, this does not mean that we need to do an overview of migrants. Migrants, unfortunately, are disproportionately affected by many of the common infections. Uh, some of them, they are low prevalent in migrants, um, such as uh, tuberculosis or HIV or hepatitis B. Sorry, they are low prevalent in Europe, but they are like a more disproportionately affected by, mig mi by migrants. There are other important diseases that they are not prevalent in European countries. And the main problem with that is there is like a lack of knowledge, there's no research on this population, and also we have less evidence about how to screen, diagnose, and manage these diseases and migrants. And that is the work that we have tried uh, to do across this year. So first question that we need to do when we're talking about migrants, first question is why? And why is an important question? Because we always thinking about a public health um, um, decision when just deciding just to screen or not to screen. But if we look at to the definition of a screening in an epidemiology book, they say that the purpose of a screening is to reduce the risk of death or future ill from a specific condition by offering a test to identify people who could benefit from treatment. So we don't know, we don't, we cannot forget the individual health impact that this screening may have in an individual and not only the public health impact. Second, then we can just talk about when we are going to implement before, before arrival to the host country or just arrival or after the arrival. We, we may have a lot of examples, for example, in the United Kingdom, the pre-entry screening programs for tuberculosis, whereas other countries are organizing health assessment when the people has arrived. Then how? It's going to be confidential, a compulsory screening, how we can ensure the confidentiality of this population. It's also an important question to be addressed. And then where? We may implement a lot of programs in, at different levels of care. We have primary care, blood banks, transplant units, uh, antenatal care units, etc. So that's also decisions that we need to take when talking about the screening. Then who will, who will pay for? That's, for example, in my country, in Spain, or also in Sweden, the migrants, they don't have to uh, pay for the screening, but uh, in the pre-entry screening programs, such as tuberculosis in the United Kingdom for applying for a visa, are the migrant populations who are planning to go to the countries who are in charge of paying all these costs. And finally, whom are going just to screen any migrant could we identify the, high, the really high risk population for which they are going to have a clear benefit when we are developing a screening? And finally, the most important question is also what. And then for, for understanding what we are going to screen, that is a very uh, you know, complex and, me and messy table that is about the Wilson and Journey criteria that are summarizing the characteristics that a DC should have in order to be um, um, suitable for implementing for a screening program. I was trying to summarize in something a little bit more simple. First of all, should be a public health problem because otherwise we are not going to convince our governments to implement these type of programs, but also, it's a sort of disease that is like a time bomb in our body. So it's going to be asymptomatic in the majority of the population, but it's going to be chronic um, in most of them, because if it's uh, acute, uh, it's very unlikely that we are going to catch the infection when we do the screening. And also potentially severe. Uh, in part of the population. And then we can add other things, right? So we can add, we need like, to demonstrate that this intervention is going to be cost effective. We need also a good sense, a good test that is going to have a high sensitivity. Other than that, we are not going just to catch most of our population. And of course, the intervention may be acceptable uh, for the majority of the population. Um, so then I'm going just to put an example about how around all these questions for what should we screen, we were generating evidence on a couple of diseases. I'm going just to highlight, for example, these infections, strongyloidiasis, you may be familiar with. Um, that is a, a, a neglected infection that in the past was so neglected that even was not even in the list of neglected infections. Now it is. Um, but, you know, it's an infection that is largely underdiagnosed with a global prevalence of 8%, affecting almost six, more than 600 million people worldwide, and familiar for most health professionals, particularly in non-endemic areas. But most important characteristics, most people asymptomatic, 
It's a chronic infection because it's quite unique. It has an auto-infection cycle. It means that irrespective of when a migrant is coming to your host country, they may have, they may carry the infections uh, for worldwide, so for the long term, if untreated and potentially severe, particularly uh, under immunosuppression. You may be familiar with the hyperinfection or disseminated syndrome, uh, that is, uh, the, the mortality rate is quite high. So then we have these three characteristics, as I said before, asymptomatic, chronic, potentially severe. And also public health problem, we were trying to estimate what is the global prevalence in migrant populations and in this systematic review of meta-analysis, we were estimating that based on serological tests, the prevalence, the global, the, the global pool prevalence of strongyloidiasis was around 12%. And that, that was giving us the idea that strongyloidiasis affects migrants from all global regions because it was not only sub-Saharan African migrants, the prevalence in Latin migrants coming from Latin American countries and certain parts of East Asia was also quite high. Also, this data could be used uh, to inform screening decisions in migrants, and also they were confirming us how the use of serological screening is going to be much more sensitive and easier compared to a stool test. That was the, the, the former um, gold standard. Also, then we were just trying just to generate evidence around what are the tests that we need to use for a screening. As I said before, we uh, did another um, a study where we, uh, we were evaluating the sensitivity of different serological tests for strongyloides that undoubtedly they are much more sensitive compared um, um, with, the, with the stool test, with the direct techniques. And also concerning the acceptability, we were performing also with our Italian colleagues a trial where we were demonstrating that even one single dose of ivermectin uh, could be enough to treat uh, uncomplicated strongyloidiasis. So then, with all these three characteristics, ECDC were developing uh, these uh, guidelines for targeting new arriving migrants and infectious diseases screening. And then for the first time, they were introducing parasitic infections. They were also highlighting, we were trying just to map a little bit countries where we think that the disease is going to be uh, endemic. And also importantly, we were addressing some important parts such as immunosuppressed populations where the screening is even more important because they are at risk of developing hyperinfections, but also some implementation challenge. For example, ivermectin may be not be available in many of the countries. Now with COVID, they have changed a little bit, at least in my country, finally they have approved and, and for this reason, but also other things such as migrants facing numerous barriers to accessing healthcare, socioeconomic, stigma, linguistic and cultural barriers. So that's just, this is also something that we need to address when implementing screening programs. And finally, we did a cost-effective cost analysis to understand which is the best strategy to address strongyloidiasis in migrant populations. We were comparing quite a lot of different strategies, such as providing ivermectin to everybody in primary care, providing ivermectin in people that you are going to immunosuppress, performing serological tests plus treating those that they are positive, etc. And you know, the results were very clear. And actually, providing presumptive treatment with ivermectin to the people that you are going to immunosuppress was not only cost effective, but cost saving to the health system. However, this is, there was always a however, we may consider other things before implementing this. So the, respective of the cost effectiveness, we need to understand the heterogeneity of the different health systems because maybe it's not feasible to implement in primary care or the hospital level. We need to consider, as said before, the availability of ivermectin, acceptability of this strategy because in the end, we are treating people that maybe they may not have the disease. Would the autochthonous population accept this type of strategy having a very good test with a very high sensitivity or not, and also considering ruling low alua co-infections before giving ivermectin, but that could be uh, quite easily achievable because that is quite a few countries that are still, that are only endemic for that infection. Let's uh, go for another infection, Chagas disease. Again, you may know you are familiar with infections, right? But it's a chronic infection, asymptomatic in the majority of the population, and only a certain percentage are going to develop cardiopathy. And we, it might be associated, you know, with sudden death, etc. But that is the important thing to understand, potentially severe. Also, public health problem, basically, we did the same. We did a systematic review and meta-analysis in order to address how the infections is prevalent or not among the migrants coming from endemic countries. The pool prevalence was around 4.0%. 
And importantly, for example, uh, important message to say, there's a lot of heterogeneity when we compare the prevalence in the country of origin compared with the prevalence in migrants. You can see in Bolivia, prevalence at the country level is around 6%, whereas the prevalence um, in migrant population is almost 20%, likely because they are coming from high endemic areas uh, in Bolivia, for example. Mm, and also, if we want to see whom should we screen, there was also a lot of strategy to try to control the transmission because Chagas can be transmitted at blood bands, transplant unit, and also um, vertically from the, from the pregnant woman to the newborn. And we were also trying to understand which are the health policies implemented in European countries to address that point. It's likely that it may have changed because that is quite old maps, but I have not found a more updated versions of these maps. But in any case, the main problem we have with the congenital way. You see that, you know, in blood banks, transplant units, many countries have started to implement either screening or rejecting blood donation uh, from people at risk from these countries. Whereas from uh, there's only few programs in European countries to address this problem in pregnant women. Um, uh, I would like just to highlight how when we are implementing this type of programs, which is the example of Catalonia, for example, we can see how the number of undertreated children, this is much less compared. So here in this, um, in, in, in this figure, I'm comparing the strategy in different regions in Spain. And you can see how Catalonia is doing very well because we have implemented many years ago um, Chagas disease screening program in antenatal care units. But then what are the challenges uh, during the implementation of this type of screening program? And that is an exercise that we did after completing the ECDC guidance on uh, screening new arriving migrants. And a few things that we need to consider. Are we able to conduct a participatory approach when we are just developing this type of migrants? So are we just researchers just developing the evidence or are we including the perceptions of migrants, stakeholders, policymakers, etc.? how we are able just to provide to have a migrant sensitive health systems because we may have other barriers and may, they may not be barriers related to the entitlement of having access to healthcare that is another problem In, they may be barriers related to cultural or linguistic barriers uh, also ensuring the access to healthcare so it may be in some countries for refugees but not for undocumented migrants so whenever we implement a screening we need to ensure uh, that we are going to link to care for those that they are positive right um, and also, how we can have an individualized approach, that is very important. We cannot put all migrant population in the same box because they, there is very heterogeneous um, in this population. For example, Chagas is only Latin American. Schistosomiasis is patchy distributed in different countries. Um, so it's important to understand if it is possible to have to, uh, this individualized approach. And also, how we can target this lack of knowledge of some of these infections that they are absolutely unfamiliar for most of the health professionals, particularly uh, uh, at primary care doctors. Having said that, I would like just to highlight how the advantages of primary care could be a good system to implement this type of screening programs. Um, because sometimes the formal screening in this type of health assessment may miss some groups. So you may have some centers where you can do all these screening tests, tropical units, hospitals, beds, etc. But you know, you're not reaching the majority of your population. So primary care, I think, is a good place uh, to reach most of this population. Uh, a screening could be routinely delivered in these uh, in primary care centers, and also it's a the, the ideal place for migrant health provision. So in this regard, we, did, we implemented a screening tool at primary care level, and it was a multi-infection screening tool. Uh, we were trying to address all these implementation challenges that I was saying before. So it is a personalized screening digital tool that identify in the health system, in the health information system, the migrant at risk of imported diseases using structured variables such as sex, country of birth, or age. It is integrated in the health information systems and what is is a clinical decision support system targeting only three variables, country of origin, sex, and age, and also considering previous tests or previous di diagnosis of these infections. I am not sure if I have much more time, but that is basically how the, 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 the system is working. That is when the administrative stat is recording, you know, the general data, they put country of birth, sex, and age, and then this information is recorded in the health system. So then the next time 
that the, that the patient is coming to the primary care center, the medical doctor, without saying anything, without being care of migrants, they are going to receive a message saying that, okay, you should screen here for schist or, in this case, mental health and tuberculosis. We were including eight conditions, including female genital mutilation plus mental health plus seven different infections. And, and the preliminary results were suggesting that we were having very good results, at least for the infectious diseases. We were increasing a lot after the implementation of the screening program in red you have the intervention centers compared with control centers where we did not implement this type of tools so what we are doing now is scaling up this uh, tool in other health information system in this case in Andalusia and another region in Spain and we are very interested if anyone is interested in applying this type of uh, tools and clinical decision support system to talk to me and to try to implement in other countries um, finally implementation gaps yeah Final slide, sorry. I was, I was also trying to address implementation gap uh, for screening that we still have not addressed, which is basically a lack of population-based data on the prevalence of this type of infections and which is the associated burden. So because that will be very important in order to address this type of individualized screening approach. So we need to have more populist data, uh, sorry, prevalence data in migrants and not in the country of origin. Also, we have limited data on the health impact evaluation. We need to do this type of studies, this process evaluation about when you implement the screening, how you measure the impact on the population, how you're going just to analyze better the cost effectiveness and not only the cost uh, to the health systems. Um, and also how we can analyze the cost effectiveness of multi-infection or multi-disease screening approach. Um, also formal training to health professionals, not only on infections or not only on imported diseases, but also on migrant sensitive culture, how we can approach better and to go and to, to target in this population and to say to them that you need to screen in, how that is, um, we need just to have this type of migrant sensitive culture. And finally, the perspective of the migrant population should be always considered when designing this type of, um, when designing this type of programs. Uh, and also research to, in order to evaluate the acceptability and accessibility of this type of programs in our migrant populations. And finally, uh, we need also political commitment that sometimes we don't have uh, in order to improve the health of migrants in, in Europe. And also, pues, mm, I think that is very important clear message that we need to ensure an access to healthcare free uh, in order, you know, aligned um, with the Mm, agenda of just having this universal, universal health coverage uh, for everybody. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thank you very much, Anna. I think we'll take questions in the end and yeah. then move on to uh, Andreas Vongdal, next presenter. Uh, Andreas Vongdal is a medical doctor specialized in infectious diseases working at Westeros Hospital in Sweden and also researcher at Department of Medicine Solna Karolinska Institute and will present his research on malaria screening in migrants. So please, Andreas. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, this talk will be uh, about malaria, screening for malaria in migrants from sub-Saharan Africa arriving in Sweden. And this study was, uh, part of this study was published earlier this year. Um, and the background really is uh, that we know that there are asymptomatic infections uh, with malaria parasites in endemic area. Uh, and in some of the areas, um, like in Central and Western Africa, they reach over 50% of the population. Uh, so it's safe to assume that uh, these infections will persist in migrants who, after they arrive in uh, non-endemic countries. So, um, and we know that despite that these infections are asymptomatic, there are a few studies that describe um, uh, a negative health impact. Um, and the first is anemia, that's well known, it's also complications during pregnancy. Uh, there's also some, some reports of um, um, hyperreactive um, um, uh, malarial splenomegaly, and also Burkitt's lymphoma, renal impairment, and, and even cognitive impairment. Uh, we did a survey uh, with all public health agencies in Europe 
uh, in 2018, and at that point there were no, no countries in Europe screening for malaria. Uh, and about at the same time, the ECD guidance uh, uh, on migrant screening uh, were published, and they did not mention malaria at all in this document. However, in Australia, uh, there is a recommendation to screen children from high endemic countries. And in the US, they have a different approach uh, with a recommendation of presumptive treatment instead of screening, um, and then to give artemitolum uh, in combination with ivermectin, albendazole, and praziquantel. And also, we should not forget the WHO um, recommendation with intermittent treatment during pregnancy and also during infancy. And for migrants arriving in Europe, they will no longer be reached by these recommendations often. So the aim of our study was to uh, estimate the prevalence of malaria in migrants arriving in Sweden and also to have a look at the duration of infection. We included um, uh, participants, both adults and children, uh, between April 2019 and June 2022. And we did this at five different site, sites, basically. Uh, the first and the major one was uh, in the Migrant Health Assessment Program. And that, that is a program in Sweden where we invite um, newly arrived migrants to have a health checkup, uh, including uh, uh, a nurse contact and also some blood tests taken for, uh, for example, HIV and viral hepatitis. Uh, we were also present at the infectious disease clinic uh, where we included patients who came for, uh, uh, for example, latent tuberculosis or follow up on hepatitis B. Uh, so there were no, no sick patients, no febrile patients um, uh, in the study. Uh, we also sent invitation letters um, to um, migrants that had arrived from, from uh, DRC Congo and Uganda. Uh, and that was uh, because of um, uh, both the, the COVID pandemic um, made the attendance to the uh, health, migrant health assessment program to drop. And we also wanted to follow up on, on some preliminary result that we had a high prevalence in exactly this group. Uh, we screened relatives to, to confirmed cases, and we were also present at one of the antenatal clinics in Stockholm. We had a questionnaire uh, to collect um, uh, some basic medical background and also the migration background. Uh, we did a rapid malaria diagnostic test, uh, and we also did a uh, multiplexed PCR, uh, looking for the four species, falciparum, vivax, uvale, and malaria. And we also measured the HB level. And all uh, RDT or PCR positive individuals were referred uh, for treatment. The cohort looks a bit like this. So you see uh, in Central Africa, we have DRC Congo, uh, with uh, over 20% of the cohort came from, from this country. And that was due to uh, quota refugees um, accepted to Sweden from, from DRC. Uh, we also have uh, large migrant groups from um, Eritrea uh, and also Somalia, and to some extent also uh, Sudan and, and Ethiopia. And this represents, our cohort represents fairly well um, the migrant group who came to Sweden during this period. Uh, there was a one-to-one -one male female ratio, um, and we had 789 uh, participants in our study in total. 30% children about, and um, uh, we had some um, patients with ongoing pregnancy as, as well. Uh, we didn't take a blood test for that, but there was reported pregnancies, uh, 39 of the included uh, participants. So having a look at the results, we found 71 PCR positive uh, individuals, uh, so that is 9% of the full cohort. And breaking it down to the different sites, we have a little bit of difference uh, in, in the numbers. Uh, we see at the Migrant Health Assessment Program, we had 10.4% PCR positive, and this was the most kind of unselected group um, in, in the study, the unselected group of migrants who came from, from all of the countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, looking at the infectious disease clinic here, I said we have more latent tuberculosis, so 
uh, in Sweden that was more uh, towards the Horn of Africa, Somalia and Eritrea, uh, where we have a low risk of, of malaria. Uh, and um, we found here only two, two patients were positive for uh, malaria in the PCR. And then we, uh, among those who were invited with letters, uh, were higher, higher prevalence of 18%, um, and uh, relatives were a super high prevalence of 66%. So looking at the PCR positive, uh, the re reported last country of residence, uh, we see that uh, the redness, the red uh, color from DRC Congo have now moved into Uganda more or less. And that was often reported that uh, many migrants from, that were born in DRC Congo had um, moved into Uganda uh, many years ago and lived in refugee camps. So that was a common story. Uh, and also, um, Uganda was the um, main country for PCR positivity. We have 75% of all PCR positive people in our cohort uh, had resided in Uganda before arriving in Sweden. We detected all species. Um, P. falciparum was the main one, 40%. And then we also found P. oval and, and P. malaria to the uh, same extent. We had some uh, mixed plasmodial infections, uh, including also uh, two cases of P. vivax. We had a, a clear clustering of uh, PCR positive individuals in families. Um, so 66% of all uh, PCR positive. Uh, cases uh, belong to a family where another family member was also positive. And to the, the right panel here, we have an example of uh, a family. So we see that um, the mother and father uh, and the two oldest kids were born in DRC Congo. Uh, and the mother here is positive for P. falciparum. And they lived quite some time in Uganda because the, the younger children with the age of 12, uh, between 3 and 12 years, they were born in Uganda. And they were also uh, PCR positive, but for P. ovala and P. malaria. So um, we had eight people, five of them were positive in PCR with three different species. Uh, comparing uh, the prevalence in adults and children, we have a higher prevalence in children. And that goes for the full cohort uh, to the left where we have 14% in children and a little bit less in adults. But looking at the cohort um, that came from, the, the migrants that came from Uganda, we have a super high prevalence of 35% in children. We also had a look at um, the time they lived in Sweden when they were included in our study. And uh, we see here that we have two cases that lived for over one year in Sweden when they were tested positive for, for malaria, and that was P. falciparum. We did a risk factor analysis and um, uh, could conclude that there's a high risk in small children, uh, and also if you have a family member uh, positive, that's a huge risk factor uh, for PCR positivity. And also report, in patients reported um, uh, previous malaria treatment uh, within the last 12 months. Uh, that was also a risk factor. And arrival from Uganda. However, we did not find um, any increased risk in patients reporting ongoing symptoms like uh, uh, or fever and uh, not anemia either. Then we did some uh, follow-up sampling. I said, I told you that we uh, referred all patients for, uh, for treatment, uh, but this was uh, a family that we could not, we were not able to reach to, after we included them in the study, we could not reach them anymore to tell them uh, that their test was positive. Although they reappeared in another site uh, 33 months later, so it's basically three years later. So in the end of the study, um, and we asked them if they wanted to be part of the study again, and they told us, well, we already been, but uh, we, we never heard about any results. So we could tell them, oh, you are actually positive and we want to treat you. And we took new blood samples and they were still positive for P. falciparum and P. malaria. So some concluding remarks then. Um, 
we could see that malaria was prevalent in migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there was a high prevalence, especially in migrants arriving from Uganda and, and even higher in, in children from Uganda. Uh, but we should bear in mind that uh, risk groups may vary across different European countries due to different migration patterns and is also likely to vary over time. Uh, we could see that there was a high prevalence of PCR positivity in family members uh, around an index case. Um, and so we should really consider, and I'm, I'm aware that many centers offer uh, screening for, for uh, siblings, for example, around uh, a case of malaria in, in the clinic, but not all, perhaps. Uh, so to the big question, should we screen for malaria or not? Uh, so definitely there's a high prevalence in some, in, in some uh, certain groups, but we lack study on health impact and also on the uh, health economic aspects of screening for malaria. So uh, I have some bonus slides and about two minutes to go. So um, we have followed up uh, uh, some clinical aspects um, of, of these cases when we um, referred them for treatment, so we did a uh, retrospective chart review. And in the left panel, we see two bars uh, where we have, to, in the left bar, we have uh, patients positive for malaria, and in the right bar, we have um, participants that were positive for uh, strongyloides and or um, schistosomiasis. That was also part of the, another part of this study. And here, but here they act as a control group, and we can see that this group compared to the malaria group, in the malaria group we have a much higher uh, prevalence of uh, hepatosplenomegaly, uh, reaching 26% in this group. Um, and we even had two of the 16 um, fulfilling criteria for uh, malaria hyperreactive splenomegaly syndrome. Uh, we could also see that uh, some lab parameters uh, improved after uh, given malaria treatment. And that goes for hemoglobin, platelets recovered, the sedimentation rate was lower uh, after malaria treatment, and also uh, total EGM. And with this, uh, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming here this morning. highlighting this uh, important and neglected aspect of, uh, of malaria. I remind you that in Southern Europe we have, uh, uh, we still have Anopheles, uh, particularly in, in Italy, in Southern Italy we have uh, Anopheles of the Maculipenis group, uh, particularly Anopheles Labranchi, which is competent mainly for Vivax, but, but we saw many cases of B. Vivax, and, but also for P. falciparus. And uh, actually we had uh, uh, more than 10 cases of uh, introduced malaria in Italy in the, in the last few years. So this is a very important aspect for, for our public health system. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Kohn. Uh, of course, he doesn't need introduction because he's been very active for many years in tropical medicine. And so probably most of you uh, already know him. Uh, uh, it's sufficient to say he's a professor at uh, one of the most important universities in the world, maybe, maybe the most well-known, which is the Sorbonne University in Paris. He's been a director of the Center for um, Infectious and Tropical Diseases at the Hôpital uh, PTA Salpetriere uh, for, for a long time, and now he's working as a consultant uh, at the um, Hospital Hôtel Dieu in the very center of Paris, correct? At the uh, Alil de la Cité, correct. Mm. So uh, he will speak about STI in uh, today, uh, STI in migrants overview and screening. Thank you, um, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. So I'm going to speak about STI in migrants um, on the eyes of view of my hospital, Hotel Dieu, downtown Paris. If you are interested in visiting it. Uh, I have no conflict of interest to disclose uh, related to this presentation, although I have some conflict of interest. 
but they will not impact my presentation. So before to go to the topic, I just would like to give you an epidemiological background about STI because it's a real cause of concern, uh, I think, on a growing cause of concern. So we, uh, according to the last STI uh, report uh, of WHO, which was uh, published in July uh, 2023, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are more than three, 30 microbial agents that can give rise to FTI, mainly bacteria and viruses, but also parasites. Um, according to WHO, there are eight leading STI, four are curable, uh, trichomoniasis, chlamydia, trachomatis, Nesharia gonorrhea, and treponema pallidum, and four are considered as non-curable, uh, herpes, uh, papillomavirus, uh, hepatitis B, and HIV. Uh, WHO underlined uh, a very important point, which is the emergence of new STI. Um, indeed, uh, neglected tropical diseases uh, may be transmitted uh, uh, through the sexual route, and very importantly, some of them can be transmitted uh, weeks or even months after cure, uh, which is the case of Ebola, uh, and at a lesser extent, Zika. And we have had a very good example of an emerging uh, STI with monkeypox recently. Uh, WHO uh, includes Shigella and meningococcal disease among the new STI, but in fact, it's not new STI, it's a re-emerging STI because uh, before AIDS occurred uh, in uh, Europe, uh, there were Shigella infection and meningococcal uh, diseases, mainly in males having sex with males. Um, so there's a re-emergence of neglected STI also, like lymphogranuloma venerum. Uh, there's an impact of child health, of course, uh, which may be infected during pregnancy, at delivery, or during breastfeeding. And of course, a main and really highly worrying issue is the antimicrobial resistance that we are facing with Nesharia gonorrhea and very importantly with men, uh, Mycoplasma genitalium. So these are the, the data, more than one million STI acquired every day, uh, uh, mainly Trichomonas vaginalis, uh, Chlamydia trachomatis, gonorrhea and syphilis, uh, five, 500 million with persons with genital herpes, uh, 300,000 deaths due to HPV, one million pregnant women uh, with syphilis, um, on impact of sexual and reproductive health worldwide. Um, I skip this slide. I think uh, all of you is aware uh, of the main risk factor of STI. So now STI in migrants. I think there's a real problem because it's a, a blood uh, on born virus approach because it's very easy to screen blood on born virus infections. So apart from blood on blood born virus infections, mainly HIV, HBV, and HCV, there is no valid data about STI uh, in migrants. Uh, also, there are confusing data about syphilis. I will come back on it later. Um, on the, the main problem is that STI other than blood on bone virus infections are uneasy to screen because there is no uh, reliable serological testing, uh, which explains the striking lack of data. Uh, for instance, there was one single retrospective series about STI in migrants on genital gonorrhea accounted for 0.03% uh, of the STI diagnosis in a, in a series of migrants which were all uh, consulting uh, geosentinel sites because they were sick. So I start with HIV. Uh, eight studies uh, um, evaluated the impact of HIV. Uh, four studies evaluated the seroprevalence of HCV on HBV, and four studies evaluated the seroprevalence of uh, Treponema pallidum. I have listed the series here. Um, on, I summarize all these series on these uh, slides, uh, what you have uh, to keep in mind. Uh, first, uh, you see that 
all these series, with the exception of one, are coming from Europe. Uh, there's one worldwide series, uh, but otherwise, all are coming from Europe. The migrants which were screened are mainly coming from Africa. So there's a, a very important bias for that. The number of uh, migrants that were screened, who were screened is quite low. And they are, in most of the series, they are asymptomatic migrants. There are only two series where you have symptomatic migrants. And uh, in the right column, you have uh, the, the disease for uh, which they have been uh, screened. So mainly HIV uh, and at a less extent HBV, HCV and treponema pallidum. Uh, regarding syphilis, there is a very important confusion in the literature. Uh, the seroprevalence has been estimated uh, between 0.7% to 3.7%, uh, uh, but the serologic test, either treponemal or non-treponemal, do not distinguish between venereal syphilis or non-venereal treponematosis, uh, such as uh, endemic syphilis, yos, or less commonly PITA in South America. Um, and indeed, non-venereal treponematosis are caused by treponema species uh, that are morphologically and antinergically identical to venereal syphilis. So you cannot distinguish venereal syphilis from other uh, treponematosis according to a serological test. And the problem is that non-venereal treponematosis are endemic in mainly uh, LMIC countries uh, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. HIV infection, probably the best known uh, STI, uh, being evaluated the most. The cerebral prevalence varies from 0.4% to 5%. The factors associated with HIV are uh, unprotected sex and being unaware of uh, the HIV status. Uh, factors that are not associated with being HIV uh, are not really uh, issued for the common sense. Uh, origin, uh, African origin, alcohol consumption, being married, having had prior STI, and having had casual sex with sex worker. Surprisingly, it is not associated with uh, HIV, uh, being HIV infected. And there are contradicting evidence regarding sex, uh, age, uh, and education. Uh, regarding HIV, H HCV, and HBV infections, uh, it has been evaluated in four uh, studies. The serial prevalence of HBV was estimated between 0.7% to 12%, according to the country uh, where the migrants are coming from. And the serial prevalence of HCV is also uh, varying from 0.8% to 5%, again, according to the varying according to the country they are coming from. Um, of note, this viral hepatitis, of course, they may be sexually transmitted infections, but uh, in migrants coming back from endemic, coming from endemic countries, usually HBV is acquired perinatally or during early childhood in high endemic area, uh, whereas HCV infection uh, cannot be considered really as a STI, except in some uh, male having sex uh, with male. But as you know, it is not transmitted uh, sexually in heterosexual uh, couples. Um, most uh, HBV studies also do not distinguish between uh, antibodies and antigens. Um, so the sexual transmission risk is over-evaluated because we don't know if these uh, migrants uh, found to be uh, antibodies positive are also antigen positive, uh, so are contagious. So these infections are considered as STI, although in most of the cases they have not been acquired uh, sexually and they will not be transmitted uh, sexually with some exception, of course. Uh, I just like uh, I just would like to, to point a very important thing to finish. Uh, it's the problem of sexual violence. Uh, of course, in our society, as all of you knows, uh, but also, uh, and of course, it's quite important in refugees and asylum seekers. Unfortunately, this is not very well studied. Uh, this is not assessed. 
and uh, I had to, uh, to, to see uh, a, a journal of forensic on legal medicine to have this data. And you see about, uh, about 240 asylum seekers were assessed uh, for uh, sexual violence and sexual violence was reported for 37% of women and 4% of men, and it's highly probable that these uh, are completely underestimated uh, uh, data. Uh, probably um, the rate of sexual violence in uh, migrant women is much more important than that. And this is, I am uh, nearly sure about that although it has not been evaluated uh, uh, scientifically. So my conclusion slide uh, on, is about the screening recalls. Um, every arriving migrant, migrant, I think, should be screened for sexual violence, uh, especially women, of course. Uh, victims should be offered comprehensive STI screening on free treatment. Um, Otherwise, uh, given the F burden uh, carried by the eight leading STI, uh, I think, but it's my personal opinion, it has not been validated, uh, uh, it should be recommended to screen all asymptomatic migrants at risk of STI for uh, the leading STI, uh, trichomoniasis, chlamydiasis, syphilis, gonorrhea, HPV infection, HBV infection, HCV, and HIV. And last but not least, um, I conclude by reminding the audience the main rules of the prevention of STI. It's very easy to summarize. It's called safer sex. Uh, and it has not changed for decades, if not centuries. That's the best way to avoid a sexually transmitted infection. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, for, and thank you for highlighting the problem of, of uh, uh, sexual violence, which is uh, a main issue in this in these cases. Uh, the ones of us who started their practice during the uh, at the beginning uh, or during the AIDS pandemic saw uh, a great decrease in in uh, uh, STIs, but this is not happening in the last few years. Uh, they are increasing mainly syphilis. They are really very very f more and more frequent. So we have to to take care of, of this uh, of this problem. Thank you, Mich uh, Michele Michele Spinici is a researcher at the University of Florence and a physician at the um, Infectious and Tropical Disease Department of the University uh, Hospital of Careggi, Firenze, Florence. Um, he and his group have been studying uh, a lot on uh, um, uh, neglected tropical diseases, particularly on Chagas diseases, and so he will speak uh, to us about neglected and emerging infectious diseases in pregnancy. Please. Good morning, uh, everyone. Thank Mark for the introduction and uh, uh, thanks to the uh, societies that organized this uh, interesting session. Uh, as uh, uh, Guido said, uh, I'm uh, uh, working in a center in Florence, uh, uh, Tuscany region, where uh, two uh, regional referral centers are uh, present, one for the uh, tropical uh, disease uh, study and treatment, and the other one for the uh, infectious disease in pregnancy. So we have the uh, possibility to see uh, a number of overlapping uh, uh, patients, uh, which are pregnant women with uh, infectious tropical diseases, and this chance is uh, increasing uh, over the years as the uh, number of uh, uh, births from uh, foreign-born parents uh, is uh, increasing in the percentage during uh, uh, the last uh, uh, decades. Uh, while the Italian num absolute number of births uh, and uh, the birth rate is uh, uh, steadily decreasing. 
So, uh, the possibility to see uh, pregnant women uh, harboring uh, um, latent uh, tropical infection uh, that are acquired in the endemic countries and then are uh, carried to the uh, migrant uh, country is uh, uh, relevant and uh, uh, include uh, some uh, conditions that are uh, asymptomatic that, uh, and that can uh, be a negative, uh, can have a negative impact on uh, the uh, pregnancy course itself or uh, if transmitted to the uh, newborn can be uh, cause a congenital uh, acute infection or uh, a um, chronic consequence uh, in, the, uh, in the child. For example, uh, these five conditions, uh, Chagas disease, uh, you know, can cause uh, um, acute congenital uh, uh, syndrome or chronic consequence in, uh, in, the, uh, in the life of the uh, newborn and uh, along the, the, the years. And uh, the same is for uh, HTLV-1 virus infection that can cause, uh, can be transmitted to, uh, from the mother uh, to the child and can cause uh, uh, chronic uh, consequences uh, such as the uh, T-cell leukemia or uh, um, tropical spastic paraparesis. Uh, then there is a condition uh, such as malaria, schistosomiasis, Zika virus infection that can affect the uh, pregnant, the pregnancy uh, course with uh, consequence like uh, uh, maternal anemia, uh, low uh, birth weight uh, or um, intrauterine growth retard, uh, miscarriage, uh, prematurity, and in case of uh, uh, Zika virus infection, also uh, microcephaly and uh, uh, other neurological uh, problem. So uh, this condition, um, on, this, on the basis of this background, we uh, start since uh, March 2019 uh, to screen for these uh, uh, five uh, infection, latent infection, uh, by a uh, questionnaire that is uh, uh, specifically uh, targeted to uh, the uh, to identify the risk of expo exposure of the uh, pregnant women by uh, investigating. Uh, uh, her uh, country of birth uh, and uh, uh, also the history of uh, travel uh, during her life and during, uh, especially in the first month before uh, the uh, pregnancy. Uh, and also other risk factors, for example, uh, the partner history of travel uh, uh, in the months around the pregnancy, because you know that uh, Zika virus, for example, can be transmitted uh, by sexual routes, and also the history of the uh, travel to Latin America uh, along the life, uh, because uh, especially for uh, uh, travel to rural areas, uh, uh, for the risk of acquiring uh, of trypanosoma cruzi that uh, is a chronic infection uh, that can last a long life. Uh, and uh, for the same reason, the uh, screening of the mother origin uh, that can be related with uh, the transmission of uh, Chagas and of, uh, of HTLV1. And last, uh, the uh, risk uh, related to ever uh, received transfusion in the, uh, um, in the, in the life. Uh, and these five questions, this questionnaire is quite simple and take no more than two minutes. So all the uh, women are selling to our services receive this, uh, uh, this questionnaire. Then uh, the risk of uh, uh, exposure, uh, the country specific risk, uh, uh, is defined according to uh, uh, this uh, report for HTV, HTLV1 according to the SCDC report uh, that identify high prevalent countries. For Chagas disease, according to WHO uh, list of 21 countries uh, where this uh, infection is endemic. For malaria, uh, we consider at risk only uh, sub-Saharan uh, countries and uh, women that uh, uh, are uh, arrived uh, or uh, have traveled uh, um, within the last five years 
schistosomiasis uh, uh, we consider uh, to have high or moderate prevalence uh, uh, according to WHO uh, report and for Zika virus uh, uh, we follow uh, CDC uh, indication. Uh, accordingly we prepare a list of all, pe all, all countries to uh, define the um, the, the uh, condition that uh, need to be screened uh, according to the uh, potential uh, exposure. And uh, uh, if we uh, find the um, at-risk women, uh, uh, we uh, offer uh, the, the test uh, according to, to the risk. So for Chagas disease, uh, screening by uh, KMIA test, uh, the same for HTLV1. Uh, for malaria, we perform LAMP. Uh, for schistosomiasis, Western blot uh, serology, for Zika virus, ELISA. And if the result of the screening test is positive, then uh, we also uh, we, we, um, uh, proceed with the uh, second level test, confirmation test with uh, another uh, uh, serology uh, kit for Chagas disease, uh, Western blot for uh, HTLV1, uh, and uh, microscopy and uh, real time PCR for malaria. Uh, parasitological uh, 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 test for schistosomiasis uh, and PCR for uh, Zika virus uh, uh, and also uh, second level ultrasound. Uh, uh, based on this uh, screening, uh, in the first assessment we did in 2020, uh, we uh, um, performed this uh, uh, screening on uh, 40, uh, 429 pregnant women, and we found uh, uh, almost one in four were at risk of exposure for one of the, um, the five uh, conditions uh, we, we screened, and three of them resulted affected uh, by at least one uh, of this infection, one case of plasmodium falciparum malaria and two cases of uh, uh, schistosomiasis, and were uh, appropriately managed. Uh, the risk factor that uh, we uh, found uh, uh, that defined the uh, uh, at-risk condition were uh, for uh, most part uh, uh, being foreign-born uh, or having a foreign-born mother, uh, while uh, it was less important the uh, uh, history of travel and uh, uh, no one received uh, uh, transfusion in uh, this country. Uh, the um, most frequent country of birth uh, among foreign-born uh, um, pregnant women uh, were uh, Latin America, Africa and uh, Asia. These data were updated uh, a few weeks ago and uh, we uh, reached uh, 268 women uh, and uh, eight, five uh, positive cases. Uh, that's, uh, that correspond to a prevalence of 1.8%. Another program uh, focused on uh, screening for, Chag for uh, um, neglected tropical disease in pregnant women uh, addressed Chagas disease. Uh, this is a program by uh, Tuscany region, uh, and uh, you know that uh, Chagas, we have a, an important uh, group of migrants from uh, Country endemic for uh, Chagas disease in Italy. This is, there are an estimated three to five uh, thousand people uh, uh, with uh, Chagas disease, and uh, it corresponds to uh, three to four children that every year are um, born with congenital infection. But only one is reported in the literature. In the literature. So uh, a great uh, uh, underdiagnosis and under underreporting is uh, is. Uh, uh, probable. Uh, but the uh, detection of uh, Chagas infection in, uh, um, in newborn is very important because the treatment uh, in the first year of life uh, uh, allow uh, to eradicate the infection in almost all cases and prevent the long-term damage and consequences in child. So it's important to detect, to identify uh, these ch uh, children that uh, uh, born with congenital infection, and uh, it is uh, demonstrated in almost all uh, uh, guidelines uh, that uh, address this uh, point, uh, um, national, sovereign national, or for pediatric, for example.
example, uh, that identify uh, pregnant women who were born or were, who have lived uh, in uh, endemic countries or uh, we are with mother from endemic countries or who receive blood transfusion in endemic countries as at risk population to be screened. In Tuscany region, this uh, indication was uh, um, received in uh, 2012 uh, when uh, uh, the first resolution was issued uh, allowing uh, um, pregnant women to uh, um, be offered a for free test for Chagas disease during their pregnancy. Uh, and also the management of positive cases uh, is offered for free in uh, our center for the mother and in uh, the Mayer Pediatric Hospital for the, uh, for the child. Uh, and it makes the Tuscany region one of the uh, um, few places where uh, a national or the re a regional leg legislation exists uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this point. This is the uh, algorithm that you use to uh, manage the case, the case of positivity that we uh, uh, found. And uh, as you can see, uh, they, um, if they're not present alarm signs, the uh, tests are performed uh, uh, 30 to 40 days uh, after uh, the delivery with the serology, hemoscopy, and PCR. If the uh, hemoscopy and PCR are negative, uh, the serology is uh, repeat at uh, ninth, uh, ninth month, and then uh, if the um, value is uh, increasing, uh, the uh, diagnosis of congenital infection uh, is confirmed. Uh, otherwise, if is uh, decreasing, we repeat the test uh, uh, after three months, uh, and uh, uh, then we decide if we can confirm or exclude the diagnosis of Chagas disease infection. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, adherence to this uh, uh, protocol, to this protocol, is not so high. It was not so high in the uh, previous year uh, when the uh, adherence was less than 20 percent over in uh, in all the region. Uh, then, in the last year, is uh, uh, a bit increasing, and uh, it's. Uh, 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 thanks to an uh, effort that we made uh, since uh, 2019 when uh, we start, uh, at least in our hospital, that receive 38% uh, uh, of cases uh, of uh, at-risk women in, from all the, the region. Uh, we uh, introduce a checklist in the electronic record uh, uh, that we have in our hospital that appear, uh, that be, must be filled by the um, gynecologist at the, at the moment of the uh, admission, and it allow to uh, increase the uh, percentage of uh, at-risk women that are uh, uh, that undergo the screening until 70 uh, percent after the introduction. Then a training uh, dedicated to uh, um, all healthcare workers involved in uh, the management of uh, women, uh, of pregnant women, is uh, offered on the, um, on the web page of the Tuscany region. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the other effort we made to try to uh, improve the adherence uh, to this protocol. So my final remarks are that uh, uh, physician and gynecologists uh, uh, must be aware that Latin tropical infections are not infrequent in pregnant women uh, from endemic countries. And uh, uh, for uh, those uh, condi Latin conditions that are um, that can be can have a negative outcome of pregnancy or, or, or uh, on birth, and uh, for what exists treatment or prevention intervention, uh, the uh, screening must be uh, systematically performed. Uh, then uh, the uh, diagnostic uh, test uh, should be considered for other condition, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, after case-by-case -case evaluation for other uh, infections that can be present, for example, hookworms uh, is a well-known uh, risk factor for um, bad outcome, in, in can have a bad impact on pregnancy, so uh, should be considered, but after case-by-case -case, uh, uh, evaluation. And for other uh, conditions, for example, strongyloidiasis, the um, 
uh, there are not enough data to uh, uh, issue recommendation uh, and there is problem of safety uh, on the, um, of the drug of available treatment uh, uh, during pregnancy. So more data are, uh, and more studies are necessary to uh, um, arrive to a recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Michele. Actually, uh, Italy is the, the second uh, country for um, immigration from Latin American countries uh, after Spain, of course, in Europe. So we have uh, this, this, uh, to face this, this problem. Uh, actually, there is also a significant uh, Bolivian community in, in northern Italy, in Lombardy, near, near in the area of Bergamo, where we saw uh, significant uh, prevalence of the of, uh, zero, zero prevalence of Chagas disease. So this is a, a significant problem for, for us. Okay. So we, we passed to the uh, last, but not least, of course, speaker, who is Susanna Capone. Susanna Capone is a, a physician at the uh, uh, Spedali Civili in, uh, in Brescia, uh, University Department of uh, Infectious Diseases. But she's been involved not only in uh, hospital work, but also in several um, primary health care programs uh, among uh, refugees and uh, immigrants, uh, both in Africa and in Italy, so has a wide experience in this field. So she will speak about uh, comparing operational models and focusing on psychosocial vulnerabilities. Not, not an easy topic. <laughs> Please. Good morning to everybody. I'm particularly touched and excited to be here and to share the results of our operational uh, projects. It's an hour because it's an history of a team which grew up throughout seven years, uh, particularly um, tackling asylum seeker and international protection beneficiaries. So, what are these projects start and start to when? Uh, they are, start is an Italian acronym for social health transversal services for asylum seeker and international protection beneficiaries. And this project was run in between 2018 and 2022. It was run by our general hospital in Brescia, and uh, it was answering to a practical need uh, by the FAMI. FAMI is a fund which is co-financed by European Union and by our Interior Ministry in Italy. This project was run, as you can see, where I live in northern Italy in the uh, region of Lombardia in the provinces of Brescia and Milan. But which was the context why this project was important in our area? In 2016, we were facing a significant increase of prevalence and turnover of asylum seekers in our area. And what was more important is that asylum seekers and international protection beneficiaries were long staying in our field area. Uh, the offer and care for what we call RTPI was quite disomogeneous. And we were also facing in our field a quite difficult moment because there was a very important transition in the reform of our local health system. But the project could develop because of a robust experience in migration. Here you can see our migration um, outpatient clinic, which was funded in 1990 by Dr. Issa Helamad, and uh, which can account for about uh, uh, 150,000 consultations for more than 45,000 migrants. And a more recent uh, uh, experience was developed since 2011 on asylum seeker and international protection beneficiaries. Which was the goal of the project? Ah, very ambitious, as you can see. <laughs> we tried to promote innovative services for a quicker, possibly, and more efficacious integrated care. 
and who was the target population? All asylum seekers and international protection beneficiaries, the vulnerable ones. And what is vulnerability? Uh, in Italy, this is defined by law, and as you can see, you can find uh, some different categories, and I will underline the categories over here. Uh, people, victims of torture, sexual assaults, or any form of violence. Uh, so what, we, what did we do? So the head project was, as we, as we said, uh, Spedali Civili General Hospital in the province of Brescia. And we decided to opt for a mobile unit approach versus a permanent clinic, which was uh, uh, located in Milan, where the other hospital uh, were partners of the project. This project couldn't exist if uh, the cooperative which were giving media, uh, cultural mediation weren't there. Uh, we use what we call transcultural approach. So, which then basically can be some, something very simple and something very challenging as well. So usually, uh, every day, particularly in 2016, the professorship call us and said, okay, guys, we have 80 people over here and you have to welcome them. So we organize every day welcoming session. Why this was important for us? Because for sure, asylum seekers arriving in new areas needed above all to be oriented, which was our health system. Why were we consulting them? And sometimes it was the first time that they were uh, meeting health staff. So after this, there was individual consultation, which was uh, anytime needed, mediated by a cultural mediator, and which was focused on travel history. Because we have seen today that if we start from travel history, then we'll, we'll identify risk factor for infectious diseases, but also for non-communicable diseases. And through this process, we went into a vulnerability assessment which was the objective of our approach to identify the vulnerable elements to invest on. And once made all these uh, steps, then we could build up specific integrated psychosocial health pathways. So all this couldn't be possible if a big part of the project wouldn't be based on reinforcing the existing network. In every country, we have institutions, we have different services who deal with asylum seekers. But the challenge is to make them speak each other uh, and to be effective. So this was really uh, a, a very important work for us, huh? to be daily in touch with police station at quarter, prefectureships, social system, health system, hospital side and field side, but also non-profit organization, NGOs, and above all, all the reception system. Uh, which are the results of our project? I told you this is an operational project, not a research project. So we could assist more than 2,700 people, most of them males, and 3% of minors. People were mostly coming from Western Africa, and then you see 8% of people from Bangladesh. And were we getting there? Were they vulnerable people? Yes, they were. So we saw that 69% of our asylum seeker and international protection beneficiaries were vulnerable people. And what is more important, I would like to see you, is that 71% of them were victims of torture and any form of violence. Um, at the enrollment time, which were the symptoms, you can see that at about 20% of them were fully asymptomatic, and then 24% were complaining itching, respiratory symptoms, and as you can see from the slide, this is a very simplified diagnostic uh, health repartition, 
where you will see that we find the diseases that we find at general practitioners. So UTI, respiratory system, but also odontopathy, musculoskeletal disease. And once again, uh, identifying the burden of, psycho uh, of psychological distress. So we compare two operational models, uh, we say, so mobile unit versus permanent outpatient clinic. And we saw that thanks by mobile unit in our province in Brescia, we could reduce assessment time significantly by 60%. Uh, this was the first mobile unit that we used and where we could perform, of course, clinical evaluation, but also all the administrative part of the work. And this is just to show that wherever asylum seekers were, we could get there, and that there was no place where a, a transcultural consultation couldn't be done. Uh, some of the outputs of these uh, projects were training events because uh, part of the work with the full network was to train people, train health staff from the emergency department, for trauma department, but also from police headquarters stations. Uh, the training was divided into different models in order to cover all the aspects of migration um, uh, taking charge. And then we produce an orienteering guide because when asylum seekers arise, we ask ourselves, oh, how could they move? once they finish consultation, because we'll not be there every day. And then we were speaking about the need of inputting our data, so we start the procurement of a common IT dos dossier. And then the governance model. We wanted to show a, a practical result, which was in the hand that a combined model, mobile unit, plus a back up of permanent unit could, could let us to reduce the distance of migrants, but also to strengthen the multidisciplinary care. From this, we are just jumping to the second phase of the project, which is start to zero, which developed in a different moment where the flex of RTP high decreased significantly where we moved from emergency phase to a chronic level, but still it is homogeneous offers in the different fields. And political transition in Italy, which really influenced the reception system. So new laws and new way to put in place the reception system. This brought to STAR2. STAR2 became even more complex. We decided to concentrate only on one homogeneous area, which was the province of Brescia, and we decided to reinforce our staff. So previously we had health staff plus uh, psychological staff, and here where you can see mental health department was directly involved as part of the project, both from Hodu's side and then from children's side. But what was very, very important was the role of non-profit organization in terms of giving a response to uh, the vulnerabilities found. Because you have health diseases, you have social problems, and then you need a work, and then you need to study. Uh, and let's focus only on the part of psychological intervention. So, what our colleagues were doing. They still were two psychologists, a psychotherapist focused on ethnopsychiatrics, uh, and they could evaluate and follow up our asylum seekers in one week time, the first evaluation, and what is very important, no time restriction for follow up. Uh, what is important is this second part of the project fell in COVID time, and we were very worried about, but we didn't have any dropout thanks to telemedicine and teleconsultation. Uh, which type of intervention were given? Multiple ones. So you can see thera therapeutic pathways were created for specific cases, 
but most of the cases it was just supportive and on orienteering talks, uh, cognitive evaluation when there was a suspect of cognitive impairment, ethnoclinical consultation for all the services needing, for example, police station could call us and ask for consultation or some other services from other hospitals. Uh, and then uh, a strong work with the field commissions for asylum seekers. Where did they come from? Still most of them came from Western Africa, but then there was a new phenomenon in this period for us, and this was represented for people coming from Southern America, which does not usually characterize our area. Uh, and this phenomenon was completely new for transgender people who were um, offering has new needs and new answer. Who was referring, as you can see, most of the referral came from reception system themselves that could refer through a referral form and through direct contact because people were knowing us. But a, a particular work was done with the field commission. And this is very important because not only we made training of field commission operators, but then they could contact us anytime they suspect a particular type of vulnerability and need to refer at higher level or just a need of certification to move an asylum seeker from a certain type of reception center to another. Once again, all this couldn't be possible if there was not a multidisciplinary action uh, on board. Um, and these are also some outputs of the second phase, and I'm particularly proud of this small one that we call Libre Scuola. We did an important work of health literation, and uh, we produced these books, which is not only a paper book, but we base it on a QR code. And this was very important because any operator or asylum seeker could enter, choose his own language, Urdu, Wolof or whatever, and then go through the health session. So what our um, projects showed, uh, that for sure, mobile plus permanent clinic can reduce RTPI assessment time, implementing and feeding continuously the network for asylum seekers is an essential prerequisite for action. Multidisciplinary approach offers adequate care to vulnerable people, and psychosocial integrated care is just an initial step for the right to health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susanna, for this really interesting and important project on how to tackle psychosocial health problems, and I think maybe more countries in Europe could learn from this, I'd hope. So I'd like to welcome all speakers on stage, and I see now we have 10 minutes for questions, so please, from the audience, just raise your hand, and then, yeah, there's someone with a speaker there. Sorry, just one minute. Oh, okay, I thought, okay, so one minute, really short. Ten minutes came out. Yeah. Okay. Go, please. <clears throat> okay, so thank you for the great talks, everyone. I had a question about the uh, Swedish colleague that screened the malaria patients. Um, I wanted to know whether you consider the PCR result as, a, as an index of true infection, especially in the patients that were previously treated for, for malaria in the last uh, 12 months, because it's, it's DNA. Uh, and um, do you have information on what kind of treatment they, they had? And do you think it could be a, an expression of treatment failures? Because some people have, have proposed to look in migrants to detect uh, resistance in the countries of origin. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I had some problem hearing the first part, but I, uh, I think the question was about the PCR uh, method and uh, with treatment, if there was some false positive uh, 
Uh, so uh, we know that P PCR can be positive uh, some weeks or even months after treatment. Uh, and um, all of the patients in, in this study, uh, there were at least three months since, uh, since they report, had tr the treatment. Uh, except in one case, there was just two weeks. Uh, but at, in that particular case, we did also microscopy to confirm blood stage parasitemia. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, gametocytes that can, can still um, be in the circ circulation. And the PCR is also positive for uh, gametocytes only. So it could be that it's um, only gametocytes, but also they go away after some time. Um, and I think three months is about the upper limit for how long they can circulate. So I think the, at least the majority of these cases that were PCR positive in our study were true, true uh, parasitemias. And um, we did not do, at, uh, at this point, we haven't done any, uh, looked for any markers for resistance or anything, uh, drug resistance, uh, but uh, that is something that we um, look to do in the future. And we have, uh, very limited data on which kind of treatment they received. Uh, most patients didn't know. Um, but um, I think quartum is, uh, atomethylumefentrin is the, is the most common one, so it's a, it's a safe guess in, in most of the cases. Do we have time for one more question? Is that, yeah, two more questions, great. So, do we see any questions? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Janet Bosso. I'm an internist and infectious disease uh, specialist and also an HIV treating physician. Um, I would like to address a question or rather maybe something to add to the presentation of our colleague from Paris, please. Um, you suggested that, uh, that the mainstay, let's say, of approaching or, or um, um, uh, reducing uh, the incidence of SCIs is by introducing or maybe reinforcing the ABC policy, which is abstinence, uh, uh, condomize, and, and be faithful. And that is something that I have a bit difficulty with. It's, it's kind of the, 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 the let's say, the, the, the sort of policy that the PEPFAR program introduced many years ago when HIV uh, was, uh, was uh, on the rise uh, still. They had a lot of criticism for that, and I still agree with that criticism, and I don't think that we should reinforce this sort of approach. We know that um, enforcing this sort of policy doesn't work, that is to begin with, and it's also, I still think, it's rather moralizing also. So um, I think that we should try to offer um, uh, solutions to people that would actually work. So not focusing on what people should not do, but rather offering them solutions that could help them to prevent um, uh, STIs. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could respond to that. And I'm, I'm, I don't think this is my particular point of view, but that I, I do remember that time where PEPFAR introduced this and, and was talking about this a lot and had a lot of criticism from all over the world about this. So. I felt a bit surprised, to be honest, that it was kind of offered as the first solution. It was the, the first three things on your slide about uh, what to do about prevention of SCI. So I was hoping that you could respond to that. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for... <clears throat> Thank you very much for addressing this issue. Uh, of course, you are somewhere right, but my talk was not about HIV. My talk was about STI. And there are more than 30 microbial agents for STI. And unfortunately, PrEP uh, protects, of course, against HIV. No problem about that. But my talk was not about HIV. My talk was about STI. And regarding STI, regarding the major concern that we are going to face, I mean antimicrobial resistance, for instance, for gonorrhea, for Mycoplasma genitalium, I think it's quite important to remind people that the prevention of STI uh, is safer sex. Unsafer sex works very well. I am, I am sorry to tell that, 
but it works very well. It has been showed that it worked well, not in MSA, of course, yeah. but it worked well, for instance, in Thailand, during the 80s, on the 90s. I am more than 60 years old. Uh, I have seen people dying of AIDS by hundreds. Uh, and I can tell you, safer sex, I am sorry to tell it, but in Thailand it worked very well, and in Eastern Africa also it worked very well. Of course, it's not 100% protection, but against STI, there is no other solution by safer sex. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, we, maybe we should discuss this later a little bit more. Yes, but this want. is, I, d I don't think that this is something new. I mean, this has been widely discussed throughout the world, and we know that offering people uh, certain views about how you should prevent a disease doesn't work. So it's not only about the moralizing part is, is another difficulty I have, but we know that this doesn't work. We know that people have sex. We know that people have a lot of sex most of the time. And so we should work with solutions that I think that really work. And just telling people not to have sex or to, uh, or is, 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 is something that I, I is, is certainly, um, from what we know from, from what has worked in HIV prevention has not worked. So I don't think we should start reintroducing it. And whether it's HIV or another STI, it's, it's, it's the same principle in my view. But I'm happy to discuss this with you. Uh, this, after this is going to be. I a really very like to add on that uh, <laughs> the argument that I'm more than 60 years old. I'm far more than 60 years old, and I've been working in the HIV and in the STI and in all other sectors. And when you are looking now, safe sex, safer sex guidelines, you will not find this anymore. There are beautiful guidelines from several organizations. UNFPA from the WHO that stresses the arguments you say. So I think that is where we have to build on. That is the knowledge we have built on eh, in all those years. Eh, and also during the HIV outbreak. Just empowering the people eh, to practice what you say. That was something which could work, but not the other side. I think maybe if we have some other questions so that yes. also <laughs> other speakers can. Yes. But thank you. Yeah. I think one, one more question. Yes. Because time is... Maybe on another topic. Yes. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for your very interesting talks. Um, I just want to share a little bit on gender-based violence, which is a, a big problem globally, um, and especially in our vulnerable people like our migrant population. In my experience as a um, uh, women and children's project lead at Doctors of the World UK, um, I had to say this gender-based violence was always um, covered with a lot of shame and stigma. Um, and we were a, a service user-based um, guided clinic, so our consultations were guided by the, the, the question or the needs of the service user. Um, and I just wanted to stress how important the, the screening is and how underreported it is. Uh, but also how important it is to offer kind of the, the psychosocial treatment, trauma-informed care that follows kind of opening up about your trauma. Um, and if you can't provide that, I think you have to be quite careful with screening to collect your numbers um, because there's so much more that happens after you ask the question and after somebody actually opens up to you that we should think about providing as well. Can I comment on this? Yes, what we saw in six years' time is the evolution of assessment of a specific population as asylum seekers. So when we start this, it seems more important, the first evaluation assessment. But then what we discover throughout the years, it's the evolution, even of psychological effects, even, for example, of the burden of violence. So, of course, it's important, the first assessment, if we think to develop projects of screening for special population, but the, also all the follow-up. And yes, I agree. I think it's important to listen people, so to listen patients and even asylum seekers, <coughs> and then to try to develop anything which is sustainable. This is what we was trying to do with a, a multilateral approach which of course it, it's, uh, it's quite challenging. If I can comment on that, in our screening program we were introducing as well mental health and female genital mutilation because we think that they are very neglected approaches. 
And what we have seen is that training primary care doctors to try to have a little bit more cultural competence and to try to address that, we have increased quite a lot. My, so from my view, if we want just to have a big impact, you know, and to have real an impact on uh, the health outcomes of migrants, we need just to think about the sustainability of the programs. So it does not work with like as very small programs. We need to try just to set up programs that could be implemented at, at the very large scale. With all our experience in our program, what we were addressing is that uh, in the question for mental health, we were including the, the, and the same for female genital mutilation. The atmosphere of the outpatient clinic was not allowed us to deal with this question now. So we were just maybe in the second or in the third visit, the primary care doctors were addressing, we were they having like a more confident um, with, the, with the population. But the important thing is that we are not having good, good data on mental health. But at least, you know, primary care doctors are trying to address and they are understanding that this is an important topic and that is, I think, that the main health outcomes uh, for migrant and indirect one in our project. Okay. Katya. Yeah. I, I, no, yeah, I think we don't I think have time for have, more questions, yeah, right? Yeah. So we we'll don't have more time. Just like to, yeah. yeah, thank all the speakers for coming and for your great talks and also thank you for the audience we, for your attention. I think we cannot do, draw conclusions on this, this topic. This is a, no. uh, a work in progress all the time, so no, no conclusions about that. Uh, this was a, a very active, uh, active symposium. I'm very happy about that. I don't think we need a coffee, actually, but I think <laughs> we will be happy to have a coffee. Continue the discussion, so. maybe. Thank you very much, <laughs> <the> everybody. <laughs>